All right, everybody. Welcome, America, to another Lessons from the Front. I am Todd Bowden, your host. We want to thank Carry the Load for allowing us to do this uh, on their name, because uh, without Carry the Load, there are a lot of a lot of heroes that would go unsung. And my guest today, a very good friend, great story. I'm going to get right to it. Jeff Hensley, welcome to Lessons from the Front. Hey, Todd, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's really nice to be here. Well, we're glad or to have you, man. Here virtually. <laughs> yeah, virtually. Absolutely. Right. And uh, uh, obviously, I'm at an advantage because I, I know you and I've known you for quite some time. Uh, I'm also at an advantage because I was Marine Corps, you were Navy, but we, we're not going to go down that road just yet. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. We'll get there. I suspected we probably would at some point. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid off and get there right away. So, of course. <laughs> so yeah. you, have, uh, you have done quite a bit. You have seen quite a bit. And... As I always like to do, I want to find out who was Jeff Hensley before the military? Before the military, well, uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, but uh, I, I went to school at the University of Texas and I spent, uh, I was on the five-year plan and I spent most of my time uh, majoring in, in tending bar. I worked at a, a, a redneck, you know, bar in North Austin uh, slinging drinks and really didn't have a whole lot of ambition to do much, uh, much else. Uh, but fortunately, uh, Top Gun, the movie came out right about the time I was fixing to graduate. And so uh, that gave me a little bit of direction. Uh, that and my father was, uh, you know, kind of encouraged me to, uh, to pursue a different career. And, you know, that's what got me started. I, I went and saw that movie and, and uh, said, you know, I mean, that looks like, uh, looks like a lot of fun. And so, uh, I went into the Navy recruiters, I'm pretty sure the very next day, along with half of the campus, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, uh, at the time, my uh, my academic record was uh, was not real good. And I didn't have a very strong package. So it wound up taking me uh, almost two years and, and three different applications before I finally got uh, accepted into the program. Um, so during those two years, I went uh, moved back up to Dallas from Austin and I uh, started working out at a uh, at, uh, an airport, Aston Airport, actually working at a fixed based operator called Millionaire. Worked on some of my uh, my private pilot ratings and uh, uh, just sat back and, and you know tried to uh, tried to wait it out. So that so in 1986, the movie Top Gun comes out. Uh, you said your academic record was less than stellar. Yes. And it, so it, it sounds like an, uh, an eerily similar path to, to many people we know. You were <laughs> probably you just didn't have the motivation to to, to do something like that that required because I know you I know you're not you know it's you weren't a challenged student because you're, you're not smart. You just probably did not see the, the, the need for it. Is, is it something along those lines? Yeah, I mean, and it, this is something that I'm, I'm sure everybody, uh, you know, boys and girls growing up struggle with at some point. It's, uh, you know, we've got a lot of potential, you know, that's just waiting to be unleashed. But you, uh, you know, you, you've got to find that thing, you know, that one thing that really gets you, you know, uh, lights a spark and, and gets you mm -hmm. motivated and, and, uh, uh, and, and sends you, you know, gives you a cardinal direction. Right? Because, you know, for most kids, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I'm dealing with a couple of them of my own, uh, it's, you're all over the place. You know, you're still trying to find out who you are. You're trying to find out, you know, what is your place? How do you fit in this, you know, in this big world? And, uh, and that, those are, you know, those are big weighty questions. You know? uh, and so a lot of times it helps if, uh, if that one thing comes along and, and sort of sets you down that path. And it certainly was for me. So, was it Top Gun specifically? Was it, I mean, did you ever have any other uh, inkling to, towards the military? Was it just, you know, the, the, the romanticism of flying? Was it the, you know, I mean, what was it specifically about Top Gun and flying that attracted you that maybe didn't make you think of the military before? Um, well, I think with the, uh, with my family, we didn't have a, a military background. Uh, my, uh, my parents, my father was a school teacher and my mother was an attorney. And so uh, there wasn't really anybody there to, you know, to kind of uh, uh, put that on my radar. But I think, you know, after seeing the movie, it started, I started asking questions about, you know, who do I want to be? You know, what is the, uh, uh, you know, what is the end product going to be when, uh, when I finally, you know, become an adult? And, uh, 
I think that more than anything, you know, learning about the Navy and learning about, you know, values, honor, courage, commitment, and being part of something that was uh, a, you know, a very big, important mission was important to me. You know, it gave me something to shoot for. It gave me a potential identity and one that I didn't have, you know, at the time, but, but you know, really needed. Yeah, that, that so identity honestly, piece. Go, go ahead, please finish. It, yeah. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, the Jets were, were cool and uh, and it was very exciting. And a lot of times that I, uh, you know, I tell people that was definitely the motivation to get me going, but it really wasn't. It was uh, the motivation to get me there was to to be somebody that was living a life of purpose. And there were a lot of different ways to do that in the Navy. Uh, so if I hadn't have gotten into the flight program, I, I would have uh, I would have been just as happy doing something else. Well, we're we're going to come back to your to your service here in a minute, but you know, you you mentioned that your uh, your father uh, was a teacher, your mother uh, an attorney, and so what kind of law did your mother practice? What kind, what did your father teach? Um, Mom was a in uh, corporate securities litigation. Uh, the, for the vast majority of her career. And interestingly enough, I mean, she was, she got into uh, to law later on in life. Uh, my, my parents had me when they were very young. Uh, in fact, they, my mom was still in high school. And so- And where, they, where was this? Uh, uh, well, this was in, in Austin. Okay. Uh, and so she, uh, she didn't go back to school until uh, I was, I was, in middle school. And so it was considerably later. And she went back at that point with two kids and, uh, you know, raising us, went back to school full time, finished off a bachelor's degree, then went to really? law school. Yeah, got her law degree. And then she wound up being um, uh, one of the first female uh, attorneys hired at Haynes and Boone uh, down here in Dallas. And she made a career doing uh, securities litigation there. Uh, and, you know, became in her field, she was very well known as, uh, as being a um, uh, you know, a really subject matter expert in, uh, in securities litigation. How cool. And then, and then your, yeah, your dad, cool. what, what did he teach? Um, he taught he, mainly sociology, psychology, history, uh, politics, uh, political science, yeah, government, you know, he uh, was dabbled in a little bit of everything. Uh, but he, that was his second career when he got out of, uh, out of college he had worked uh, in a family apparel business that we had, and, uh, and that company wound up being, uh, uh, it fell on hard times in, in the 70s, you know, uh, back in the apparel industry uh, in those days, uh, piece goods started to be imported from uh, overseas, and, uh, and so we, in our you know, small family business, we really weren't able to compete. And so that business went under and then all everybody in my family that worked for it, we kind of all went different ways and dad went into teaching. And so he wound up doing about 25 years teaching middle school first at a, a long middle school in Carrollton. Then he, he uh, went over to Creekview High School and uh, wound up retiring from there. Interesting. Uh, yeah, four or five yeah, years I, ago. I did not know that uh, uh, that your father was a teacher and, and your mother an attorney. So uh, are, are they both yeah. still with us? Um, my mom is. My dad passed away uh, coming up on two years ago. Uh, and he, uh, he wound up getting cancer uh, that was a very um, uh, a late diagnosis. And by the time he had it, it was a, uh, uh, you know, there really wasn't a whole lot left that we could do other than, you know, make him comfortable. And he, uh, he moved in with us at the time. And that's the same time that I went back to United. Uh, he uh, uh, had moved in here and we needed somebody to take care of him full time. And so my wife, Colleen, you know, she left her job and uh, was his full time caregiver for, for uh, the last 10 months or so. Uh, I, I did not know that, but that, that just, yeah. you know, knowing you, you and Colleen, it, it doesn't surprise me at all. You two are so giving of everything that you have. And uh, it just, it, that just sounds like something she would do. Yeah, I, she, you know, she's a pretty amazing person. And, and we both, you know, obviously adored my father. Uh, he was um, you know, instrumental in a lot of different ways in my life as, as a lot of people's father is. But I mean, for me, uh, you know, that's the one thing that I always had. It was an advantage that not everybody has is I, there was always somebody there in my corner, always. You know, it didn't matter, uh, you know, how bad things were going or how rough uh, it was going. My father was always there and he was always supportive. And when, when I came back from Iraq last time uh, and got divorced, you know, I had custody of my three kids and they were all really little. 
And I'd gone back to, uh, to United at that point and, you know, had no way to care for him while I was out on trips. And dad, he put off his retirement and moved in with me to watch them. And he used to live with me for two years watching the kids when I'd go out on trips uh, during that time. And, uh, he, he just really was, uh, uh, you know, pretty amazing. Amazing. So guy. You, you had a great role model from whom to learn. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I did. Two of them really <laughs> very fortunate. That is awesome. So do, do you remember when you told, so you really didn't have military in your, in your family background, from what I understand. Yeah. Do you remember when you told your parents, you know, I think I'm going to yeah. go into the Navy and, and how did they react? Um, they were very relieved at that stage of the game. I, I think that they both were uh, concerned about, uh, you know, what I was going to do. Uh, you know, my father, he, he, uh, um, you know, he used to joke, I, you know, I, I was working at that bar and my, that was pretty much my only ambition was to continue to do that, it, except that I had decided I was going to move down to Florida and try to get a job on a cruise ship. You know, I was going to be Isaac from Love Boat. That was what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I remember my dad, this is, he's actually the one who told me I should go see Top Gun. And he says, uh, he goes, you know, I, uh, it sounds like a fun thing, you know, that you're planning. It sounds like a good job. But it, it also it kind of sounds like you're trying to live your life like Jimmy Buffett. And he said, the problem is, is you don't know how to sing. And I'm just concerned you're not going to be able to you know, put food on your table. So uh, have you ever seen this movie? And, you know, he's uh, the one that steered me that way. And so both he and my mother were uh, very, very happy to see that I'd finally gotten some direction. You know, what's, what's funny, very, super proud. What, what's funny about that, that my parents, when I told them I was going in the Marine Corps, they were coming back from a cruise and I picked them up at the airport and I said, mom, dad, I got something to, to talk to you about. And they looked at one another with a skeptical eye and they said, OK, well, we have something to talk to you about. I said, well, I'm joining the Marine Corps. And they looked at each other and they said, well, we wanted you to join the military, but that's not what we had in mind. So. <laughs> <laughs> but again, just what you were talking about, a little bit of relief because right. of a lack of, you know, really kind of a lack of direction. And I think you phrased it very well, a lack of purpose. And, and so you ended up spending, I mean, you retired from, uh, from the Navy uh, and you went right into uh, to flight school. Um, did, you, did you have your, your heart set on a particular aircraft? I did. I wanted to fly Tomcats. It was a, uh, you know, always from the moment that, you know, I decided that's the direction I want to go that, you know, I kind of wanted to go all the way. And, you know, and, and my, you know, for me, that meant, you know, going out and flying in the fleet and flying a, uh, you know, being a fleet fighter pilot. And so um, that was a. Uh, and did you fly Tomcats? I did. Yeah. I flew them uh, for, about five years out on the West Coast. I was based out of Miramar, flew with uh, uh, Fighter Squadron 2 and Fighter Squadron 211. And uh, and then when I, I came back on uh, shore duty, I went down to Kingsville and I flew T-45s down there for uh, many years. Finished off my first stint in active duty there and then rolled right into the reserves doing the same thing, being a flight instructor down at Kingsville. And so did that for probably another eight years. Um, and then uh, after that, oh, I, you sit I down in Kingsville. Job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be there next week. Uh, down in Kingsville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something you don't hear very often. Uh, a lot of people say, "Oh, yeah, I'm going to Kingsville." That's right. <laughs> it's, That's it's, right. It's kind of close to the end of the earth down there. Uh, yes, it is. At, at least our earth. <laughs> That's right. So, That's right. So you 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 serve through Southern Watch, Restore mm -hmm. Hope, Iraqi Freedom. Was, is, there, is there one that sticks out to you more than, than another? Um, well, I, I don't know that there's a, uh, uh, you know, as far as the mission itself, that anything really sticks out. I mean, we were all pretty singularly focused in, in all of those uh, operations. Uh, the, uh, the last one was most definitely the most difficult for me. Uh, and uh, for a lot of reasons, that was also the point of, where I was out in the cockpit and uh, I had been uh, uh, working in a civil affairs cell with the Army. So I was a, a naval officer attached to an Army unit. And there were about uh, you know, quite a few of us that were doing that. And so uh, that was a, a really a whole different world. You know, I mean, I was used to seeing things flying off aircraft carriers and, and uh, you know, in that world, I felt very, very, uh, very comfortable. And, uh, 
uh, very competent in what I was doing. And when I started doing civil affairs, I, you know, I felt like a fish out of water. And, uh, and that's well, a very for, uncomfortable for, feeling. For someone who didn't serve, explain to the audience, what is civil, the Office of Civil Affairs? Well, civil affairs is most uh, divisions and actually most units of the military will have a, a civil affairs uh, department. And uh, what it's designed to do is anytime, especially when you get into like, you know, uh, you know counterinsurgency and, and you know, things that are very likely to have operations running into civilian populations, you know, the goal of civil affairs is to go and to neutralize those, uh, those civilian populations in a way to where not neutralize, like take them out in a way where it, this is the hearts and minds, you know, trying to get them from being a, an impediment to achieving the mission, you know, and ideally you would want them to be uh, supportive of of that mission. And so that's what we did. And in civil affairs in particular, my job was to go and to uh, work with a small team uh, on the, the state-owned enterprises that were in and around Baghdad and to try to get those big industrial sites up and running. Uh, you know, the thought being that this General Shirelli's idea was that if, if you could get all of those, you know, those young Iraqis that were getting paid a couple hundred bucks to go plant IEDs, you could put them in, give them gainful employment out there at the state-owned enterprises, then you would neutralize that threat. And, uh, and so that's, you know, what I spent a year doing trying to, uh, uh, you know, that was my primary mission. The other one was working with local, um, uh, your tribal leaders and uh, uh, leaders at the, uh, the, neighborhood and provincial level and to try to get their support for what we were doing as well and you know get them also just to get some level of functioning government so it, you know it was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of stuff that you know I had really no background in um, and a lot of my team members you know did not have a big strong background in that either so uh, it, it was definitely new um, yeah so I mean really what you're talking about there is that that's that's more of a uh, a B billet or uh, a collateral uh, position um, where you go from your main job of, you know, you're, you're fighting the bad guys in the sky, you're dropping the bad stuff on the ground to now I'm going to, I'm going to embrace you. I'm going to show you the other side of America. Uh, I'm going to show, I'm going to win your heart and I'm going to win your mind. Just like you were saying, that probably was a tough transition. Yeah, it was at the time that uh, that mobilization came up. I actually was uh, was living up in Chicago. I had been furloughed from United at that point, and uh, and these orders came up to go back on active duty. And at the uh, the civil affairs piece of the puzzle over there in uh, in Iraqi freedom was a pretty big one. It was it had a uh, a lot of uh, command support, and that was uh, you know up and down the chain. They, they believed that that was the way that we were going to wind up, you know, finally extricating ourselves was by, you know, through civic action. And so uh, there, but they had run through all the civil affairs officers uh, and personnel in the army. I mean, they, you know, these guys were exhausted. They were, uh, uh, my brother-in-law, you know, it, it, he uh, uh, deployed four times in the span of six years. You know, I mean, he never saw his nieces. And, and so they, you know, there was a, 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 a you know, kind of a movement uh, to get some of the other services over there, you know, helping to, to you know, carry a little bit more load. And, uh, and so they sent this, uh, a, a request for volunteers to come over and to do civil affairs uh, throughout, you know, Navy Reservists and Air Force Reservists. And uh, that's kind of how I, I came to it. Um, so I left, you know, what I had been doing at that point, which uh, my reserve job up in Chicago, and, and I went back on active duty there. Um, so it, yeah, it, it takes was a, it takes a lot of effort to yeah. to build relationships, and I mean, because that's what you're yeah. essentially doing. If you're out with the populace, mm -hmm. you're 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 building relationships and bridges and whatnot, and and I mean, you probably were having to do it in a very uh, a very cockeyed manner, meaning you. you you know, you were smiling at them and you were welcoming them, but you didn't know if they were really going to continue to be friendly to you or if they were setting you up. Yeah, it, it, it's true. It's a very, very difficult environment to be in because you did not know. And allegiances change. They shifted and changed constantly. And, uh, you know, you, you know, one group that you thought that you could rely on at one point turned out to uh, to be working at cross purposes often. Um, and, and just, you know, the whole... Um, 
uh, you know, the battle space was so locked down all the time. I mean, when, when we would go to a meeting or go out to, uh, to see some of these industrial sites, you know, we're, we're wearing all of our battle rattles. We're showing up with a, uh, you know, six Humvees and, uh, and 30 you know, soldiers jumping out, you know, uh, putting on perimeter defense while we go in there, it, you know, it looked like RoboCop coming out, and, and you know, the the normal civilian population watching this, you know, this happen. It's very very hard to break down the uh, the fear that existed uh, with them and the suspicion that we were there trying to do good uh, because we we looked like we were an invading army, and so it was uh, it was definitely a difficult kind of uh, you know uh, uh, dance that we went through with them. Yeah, and that's a challenge because you you can't, if you just show up and say, you know, I'm leaving my weapons at home, I'm leaving my body armor at home, I'm showing, this is me, man, you're totally exposed. Yeah, and, and, and it would never have been comfortable doing that. Over yeah. There. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, no it, it, the, the dichotomy of, of those two things, I mean, but yet when you show up in your, you know, in your battle garb and, and you know, you got a perimeter covered for you. I mean, they got, they had to have been looking at that going, Hmm, are these guys really trying to be our friends or what are they doing? So a lot of, yeah. a lot of distrust there on both sides, I'm sure. A lot of that for sure. And also, you know, another big challenge that we ran into was that, you know, I, I came in there and I was there for a year and just as I was starting to, uh, uh, the, you know, kind of understand the job and to get started, get some, uh, some outcomes, you know, it was time for me to roll in another guy came in and he had to start from scratch. And I had taken over from a guy that did the same thing. And so for a lot of these, especially a lot of the, uh, the tribal leaders and stuff, you know, they saw four or five of us coming over that uh, every year it was the same pattern where we had good intentions. We wanted to, uh, to help them, but the, uh, uh, I, you know, we just weren't there long enough to, you know, to really make any headway. And so uh, that wound up being a, you know, a challenge as well. Is, is there any, any particular encounter that, that, that stands out while you were there? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a bunch of them out there. I would say probably the, uh, you know, the scariest personal, you know, time was, uh, we, uh, we were taking a Blackhawk out of Liberty over to, uh, can't remember where we were going. We, we made it about probably 100 yards on the other side of the wire. And, uh, you know, a couple of guys opened up with AKs and, and shot our helicopter down. Uh, it, the, uh, uh, we, the guy was able to turn around, do an auto rotation into and make it back over the, uh, uh, the wall. But, I, you know, it was, you know, definitely a, uh, you know, very eye opening experience for me. Um, but uh, and, I think and you said you were this was you were going on Liberty. No, no, no. We I, we were going to out of Liberty, uh, at Camp Liberty. We were going. Oh, to be, oh, out of uh, Liberty. Okay. I yeah, thought you said you're camping. I'm right. trying to figure out where you're going to go on yeah. Liberty over there, but you know, it's. I mean, <laughs> so hey, I wasn't there. So. Options. Exactly. There's not a whole lot of options. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, this was just a standard. I mean, we, you know, we would uh, uh, would have our, our meetings and uh, you know do our missions outside the wire. You know, a couple three times a. Uh, uh, a week and and most of the time we would travel by uh, in Humvees, but uh, you know occasionally we'd wind up taking the uh, you know the Blackhawks out there, and this was one of the times we were doing that. Um, uh, but yeah, oh, was, I uh, think your dog is looking for something. <laughs> oh, there we yeah, go. She's uh, I she just, think she's she's finally getting comfortable back there. <laughs> she's for the last five minutes, she's been she's been trying to find something. And I think it was just yeah. the right way to sit. So, well, I think, you know, the, the real challenge is when all five of them at the end of the day, you know, we get in there to bed and they're all doing that, you know, trying to scratch around and find the right spot. And, you know, we're just, <laughs> we're just sitting there checking. Can we go to bed now, please? Oh my but, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my Lord. It's so, a, a little bit of a zoo. Help me kind of put things in context. Um, so you, you were on active duty, you left active duty, went to United. And before you went back in and specifically over to Iraq, I mean, you were flying during 9-11. You were a commercial yeah. pilot during 9-11, a time yeah. when, when, when several of our, uh, of our commercial aircraft were you turned into uh, weapons and used against us. What was going through your head when that whole thing happened? Um, well, a lot of confusion, that's for sure. I mean, we, uh, uh, we had launched out of Hartford, Connecticut that morning. And, uh, uh, and so we were, 
Uh, really? So you, between, you, yeah. you were flying a plane that morning yeah. from Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah, we were in the first bank that launched out of Hartford. And so, you know, in, in um, United's dispatch sector, I think there were 11 of us, 11 aircraft that launched out of the Northeast. And, you know, two of them wound up getting hijacked. They, uh, the American 11 and uh, United 175 both came out of Boston. And, uh, uh, and then the uh, American uh, flight out of, uh, you know, the Pentagon and then our flight out of Newark 93. Uh, but those two were on the same frequency as we were as we were flying out of uh, um, uh, Hartford. You know, we all get up there and you're all on, uh, on departure control. And uh, in fact, we heard United 175, their very last transmission before they were hijacked. I didn't know that at the time, you know, only learned later on when, uh, um, you know, after I read the 9-11 commission report, but, you know, I sat down while this is going on and me and the guy I'm flying with are, are trying to figure out, you know, what the heck is this? And I, I'm taking notes and, and we're trying to figure out, you know, what's happening. Uh, you know, they're asking if anybody can see American 11 and, uh, and 175 popped up and say, yeah, we can see him. He's shiny side up over there, but he, he wasn't talking to anybody and they had already turned back around and uh, 175 they're saying, uh, they said, yeah, you know, we heard a weird transmission. Uh, somebody say, everybody stay seated and nobody will get hurt. And then that's the last transmission we heard. This is United 175 telling air traffic control this. And that's the last you know, thing he said before presumably they, you know, they broke in and, uh, you know, and hijacked that airplane. Um, so, so you, you, you literally know, could see them. Well, that, no, we we're listening to them on the frequency. They, 175, could had eyeballs on American 11, and we're telling air traffic control that. We're just, you know, departing out of the area, heading westbound, and listening to all this on our frequency. And, and so this all kind of transferred over to New York Center when, you know, we got higher, higher altitude, and they trans, uh, you know, changed our controlling authority and uh, and at that point then now people are stopped talking you know center is not talking to people pilots are talking to each other back and forth trying to figure out what's going on and now we start hearing stuff from the company you know the company starts sending us uh, data link messages saying that, that that you know we don't know what's happening we think uh, you know airplanes might have been hijacked you know uh stand by and so we uh you know, we started thinking, well, you know, do we start running the bomb on board checklist? You know, what do, what do we do? Is, is it, it, you know, we had no idea how widespread this was or, or if it was, you know, even uh, something, uh, a terrorist, you know, uh, type of, of operation. But um, about maybe 10 minutes after we had, uh, we had headed, you know, out of New York Center's airspace, we got a message from uh, from our dispatch that said land ASAP. That's all it said. He sent it to all 11 airplanes he was controlling. Well, not obviously not the uh, two that were hijacked, but he sent a, it was a universal message to, uh, to all those airplanes that said land ASAP. And that's for, you know, you never get anything like that from the company. I've never seen anything before or since uh, like it. And, and at that point we knew that there was something extraordinary happening. Um, and so, uh, so that's what we did. I mean, we, we wound up, you know, starting for Chicago and then apparently every airplane in the world went that way. And so we diverted over to Indianapolis instead. And when we landed there, there were airplanes up and down the taxiways. Uh, uh, you know, every inch of tarmac was covered with jets, there were no gates. You know, we sat out there for uh, probably about three hours you know, until they could finally figure out a way to uh, uh, disembark the passengers. And that's when people were able to get on their flip phones and, uh, and we dialed up AM radio and we heard what was going on. So. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a bad day. D describe that scene for me then. So, so you guys land in Indianapolis mm -hmm. and you probably don't have a checklist specifically for this situation. No, I mean, we, you really don't. It, it's at that point, you know, I, I think we were both just relieved that we're on deck, you know, we're on deck. We, you know, there were no fuel emergencies or anything, whatever's going on out there is, uh, you know, we're not going to be in the middle of it. Um, and so, it, yes, it's frustrating. A lot of the passengers were, uh, were frustrated initially, but as news started trickling in and, you know, they were calling their, uh, you know, their people on the outside and, and uh, the scope of, of what had transpired, you know, in the previous few hours started to get to them, it, people, people got it. And there, there were no angry passengers. There were no people saying, get me off and do this. I mean, people were just absolutely stunned. Uh, and uh, as were, you know, uh, our crew. 
as well. Were, were you, you know? did you have to maintain your position in the cockpit at this point yeah. when you're, when you're on the ground, were you able to get up and walk out and check on the passengers? Cause I know that would have been your first thought, but that may not be the protocol. So what, what, when you landed, yeah. how long were you there and what were you doing during that time? We were on deck for about three hours, and uh, we, uh, I, I do remember we opened the cockpit door at, at one point. Uh, now, all of the protocols, security protocols and stuff that exist now were not in place back then, and, uh, uh, you know, it really was a different environment, and so, uh, you know, in retrospect, I mean, now, I, we probably would not have done something like that. It, you know, certainly not with the engines running, but the, um, uh, once we knew we were going to be there for a while, we shut the motors down and, uh, and went ahead and opened up the door. And uh, it even let some people come up and ask questions and, and things like that, because you know, it was a long wait before we finally were able to, uh, to move the airplane to someplace where we could get the, uh, the passengers off. And, and then that was really just the first step. Then we got into the airports and it was just mass confusion. You know, there were people everywhere wandering around there were no hotels there were no rental cars nobody knew where to go or what to do um, our company was able to get us a, uh, a room at one of the the uh, hotels there um, right there close to the airport we spent uh, the next three days there uh, it just kind of walked out but I mean we were we were lucky there were a lot of people up there I had people walking up to me saying where do I go what do I do and I, you know I didn't I didn't know what to tell them so, so when you're, when you get out of your cockpit, and I mean, I don't know why this is so fascinating to me, but it is because of the, of the human element side of it, I think, I, I know you, you're, you're the type of guy that, that says you're going to go check on everybody else. You want to make sure that everybody else is okay. You're going to put your own, uh, your own fears and inhibitions to the side just to give them comfort. So as you're walking back there and you're in, I'm sure you're, you're talking to passengers Describe their their vibe. I mean, yes, shock and what's going on, but uh, I mean, tell me how that went down. Were they were some scared, some calm, some? I mean, what was going on? I think there. Were, I mean, I think shock is probably the best. Uh, uh, you know, the best description of sort of the overall feeling that everybody had. I mean, it was. Uh, um, nobody obviously had ever been through anything like that before. It, this was just so far out of the experience that any, any of us had ever, uh, ever had that uh, I think people trying to process that um, was, uh, was very difficult. And then for some of the people, especially the passengers that, you know, air travel was not necessarily uh, something that they did a lot. Uh, they, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. They, they were in a, in a city that, you know, they, we were supposed to go to Denver, you know, and so now they're in a new city. They've got no hotels, you know, they've got no, no car reservations. They, you know, had really no, uh, uh, no support. I mean, there was nothing there to help them out. And, you know, we uh, we would try to steer them to our, uh, our gate agents, you know, to, uh, in our, uh, uh, you know, customer service personnel who, you know, were, you know, trying to, as much as they could, try to provide some, uh, uh, you know, some help to these people. But we had, we had 10 jets of our own that were on deck in Indianapolis, and plus every other airline had, you know, 10 or 15 of theirs. And we, you know, normally Indianapolis would have maybe one or two jets down there at a time. And so you had about four personnel, customer service personnel dealing with literally thousands of people. Uh, and, and yeah, it was, it was very, very chaotic. Um, I think we stayed in the airport, uh, after we finally got off the jet, we locked it down and then, uh, stayed in the airport for about another, uh, you know, couple hours for sure until the company was able to secure us a hotel. And we, uh, they, they, we stayed in that hotel for, I think a little over three days until they, uh, they finally let us go back and get our airplane, uh, in the middle of the night with nobody on board and take it to Denver. Uh, and uh, so the, and the so entire was, time it's just sitting there. It's just that they moved them over to uh, to the hangar. We picked it up in the hangar because they had taken those jets over there. And, and at that point, they were uh, you know going through every single bolt and, and, you know, and screw on that airplane to make sure there was nothing to miss. Uh, you know, lifting up every seat cover er everywhere there could possibly be a threat to the airplane. And, uh, uh, and once they did that, then, you know, they allowed us to fly it back to Denver. And of course, that was replicated with airplanes, you know, all over the country. Um, uh, so it, it was, I, I remember uh, when they first said, 
that we, we were going to leave, it was in the morning of, I think, the third day. And by the time they finally kept getting pushed, push, 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 and, uh, you know, uh, more, you know, more security issues that would come up that they had to do. And everybody was just so incredibly, uh, uh, I don't want to say paranoid. They, they were just really, really vigilant that, uh, you know, after you know, what had happened on 9-11, that uh, it wound up taking all day long before we finally got out. And it was the middle of the night. And it was still, I, you know, I've never experienced anything like it before. We got airborne and there wasn't a single airplane that, uh, that was on frequency, on any of our frequencies going, going in. Uh, it, it, we were alone up there in the skies. It was very, very, very weird. You know. So once again, final question on this. I don't want to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but to just again, the human element of this, when you step out of the cockpit and you go back there to check on people, was your first thought, is there a threat on board this aircraft as well that maybe just hasn't happened yet? Or was your first thought, I, I want to check on people and just see how they're doing? Because you, you had to have a little bit of both in you. I, I honestly, Todd, I, I was very concerned about the passengers, about the anxiety that they might be feeling and stuff. But I don't think that I knew enough about, I still didn't have you know a big picture of what had happened yet. Okay. Uh, I mean, we, you know, at this point, we still, all we knew was that some airplanes had, had flown into, uh, you know, to the World Trade Center. And, and they were telling us that on, in New York Center when we were going in there, but they were saying it was a little light civil. And we thought, you know, it was a, somebody flying a GA airplane had, uh, had gone in, and, which would have been tragic, but it was nothing on the, the magnitude of what happened. And so I still didn't know that. I was able to call my, uh, my ex-wife, my wife at the time, and, um, and talk to her. I mean, she knew I was somewhere on the, uh, in the Northeast, but she didn't know where and, and didn't know which airplane I was in. So she was, you know, a mess. Uh, but she kind of filled me in a little bit more on, you know, on what, you know, what had happened. And so uh, I had, you know, I had an idea, but I, I wasn't at that point, I don't ever remember thinking that, you know, we may still be in danger. Um, and, you know, maybe it, it was, uh, it was naive, but I, I think it, just looking around, it, it's hard to describe really other than to say, I mean, we were one airplane surrounded by uh, in dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of airplanes. I mean, every square inch of the tarmac was airplanes. It was like on the deck of an aircraft carrier, except that these were commercial airliners, you know, not F-14s and, and F-18s. Uh, so it was... Uh, uh, yeah, it was just really surreal. And I think I'm pretty sure that, uh, that I, at that point, you know, thought that the immediate threat was over and I didn't, you know, think that, uh, that there was a, uh, uh, you know, a threat to us, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it was a terrible day for sure. I, I remember I came, uh, when I got back to Indy, I found out that in the back of United 175 was the, the guy that I flew with in two squadrons. He, you know, he was my Rio in BF2 and BF211. Uh, he had gotten out of the Navy and he was working uh, as a, in a financial sector up in Boston. He was going, taking a business trip out the West Coast. Uh, you know, mm. he was in the back of United 175. And, hey, I mean, I, I saw his picture there in the newspaper. I mean, it was like somebody had, you know, had uh, uh, given me a gut punch. You know? So how did, how did that day and that experience set the table for your time in service in in Iraq? Well, I, um, I I cheered the decision to go into Afghanistan and was excited that, uh, that we were going to do something. We were going to take the fight over there. Uh, I remember being very concerned about my family and about, you know, as all of us were about, you know, what might come next? Is this just the beginning? Of, of, is this going to be something that we, uh, uh, we have to face, you know, continuously? And, uh, and so I was very, you know, happy to see, uh, you know, us taking action out there, but it didn't really, um, that was so far, those were all special forces guys, you know, it was so far out of uh, what I had done in the military. I never considered, you know, that this is something that I, I'm going to be a part of, but it was different when we went into Iraq, you know, at that point now, this was, you know, this was a large scale mobilization. And, you know, although I had my issues with, you know, how and why we did it, uh, you know, this, I felt a, a uh, you know, a responsibility that, you know, I mean, this is, I'm supposed to be a part of this. I'm supposed to be, you know, uh, taken, you know, you know, 
doing my part. And so uh, when those orders came up, you know, it was a, a uh, uh, not a, not an easy decision, but it's, it, it was something that I've been thinking about for, you know, over a year at that point. And I had even discussed it with my family that if they did come up, that it was something that, you know, that, uh, that I would, you know, be interested in doing. So we, we fast forward to, you know, you, you, you leave uh, active duty, you leave active service, uh, meaning you're a reservist uh, serving uh, on active duty. Um, you get out to, because uh, you were there for three years, if I remember correctly. Oh, in, um, uh, I was in Iraq for, that mobilization was a year and a half. It was six months in um, okay in Fort Bragg getting trained and then a year in Baghdad. But prior to that, I had been on a, a year and a half uh, active duty recall down to Kingsville where I was a flight instructor down there. Gotcha. So it, okay. was, th it was three years of, uh, of active duty. Yeah. Okay. So when, when you, when you do all that, you come back to Dallas, um, you get hooked up with EQuest. EQuest, great partner of, uh, of carry the load. You were, uh, you were serving or you were getting your master's degree if I remember yep. correctly. And uh, somebody introduces you to eQuest. How, how did you come across the eQuest? And what was it that, that, that drew you to, to get involved? Um, well, it, by, uh, it actually, you know, a few years before that, when I, I first came back from Iraq, and um, that was, it was a difficult transition. I didn't handle it very well. And there, you know, there were some external factors as well. Uh, you know, I was getting a, a divorce and I, you know, had custody of my kids now and dad was moving in. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of moving there. parts, a lot of moving parts for sure. And at the time I didn't really feel like I had the, uh, the coping skills to deal with it. I mean, I was very, um, uh, I was very sad. I was very depressed, but it didn't look like that. That's not what came out to the people around me. What came mm. out around him was, was anger. And, and rage and frustration and just all of this, uh, you know, this negative energy that was focused on, you know, the people that I love. And so uh, I had, you know, kind of the catalyst or the, um, the point at which I decided, you know, something's got to give was, uh, you know, a really ugly road rage incident that I got involved with that my kids witnessed. And, uh, I, you know, I'm listening to them crying and daddy, no, daddy, no. And, uh, and, and, you know, I felt uh, a tremendous amount of shame after that and uh, decided that, you know, I need to get some help. And, uh, and so I did, I, I reached out and, uh, and started working with a counselor on my own. And, um, and it was, you know, it was good to talk to somebody, uh, but I, I was talking to somebody that didn't have any background in the military. And in my mind, you know, they, you know, I had these huge walls thrown up between me and, and, you know, the civilian world out there. You know, I, I was angry when I came back uh, and a lot of that anger, you know, I, I focused it on what I believed was a population out there that didn't care, you know, what was going on over in Iraq and Afghanistan that, you know, had no stake in, uh, in, in what was happening and, and didn't care that people were dying over there, people that we knew and loved. And, uh, and so, you know, this, all of this, you know, negative energy uh, it also, you know, played out in my counseling relationship. And so it, you know, eventually I quit going um, and probably wouldn't have gone back except for my, uh, the experience that my children had, because I, I got them in counseling too. You know, they were having a lot of issues with the, uh, uh, my being gone and then, you know, their mom not being around anymore. And then, you know, me taking care of them and just you know, being a complete asshole, you know, a terrible father. And, uh, and so I got them connected with a, a group called Operation Healthy Reunions that was, uh, you know, working with military families and providing them counseling. And it was just purely by chance that they uh, hooked my kids up with a social worker uh, named Sarah Willerson up in Pilot Point. And Sarah was working with horses. She was working with horses to help, you know, their the clients reach their goals, their counseling goals. And, you know, all three of my kids worked with her for about three months. And, uh, and it, it was crazy how, how much of a change. I mean, they, you know, they were very, very anxious, you know, very, uh, uh, very fearful. Uh, they were starting to see some issues in school with the oldest and uh, some problems with friends uh, before they started going with Sarah. And in and, and those three months, I mean, it was like you know, they got their childhood back. 
um, really transformative experience in a lot of ways for them and for me too, because I saw that and, and you know, I got excited that this is something that I want to know more about. Maybe, you know, maybe it's something that can help me too. So that's when I decided to, uh, to leave United. I took a, a, a voluntary furlough and went back to school. And while I was there, that's, uh, I, uh, you know, I focused on counseling and mainly on veterans issues and on uh, animal assisted therapy was kind of the specialty study, area of study. Um, and equine, you know, uh, activities and therapies uh, in particular. And while I was there, you know, I, I started doing a lot of advocacy work with IVA and, uh, and Michigan Continues and some other organizations. And Michigan Continues, they awarded me a fellowship to work in a local nonprofit for, uh, for six months. And that was in my last year of graduate school. And it also happened to dovetail with, you know, or with uh, uh, EQuest, uh, starting their veterans program. You know, they had been around for 30 years, but they had never really worked with veterans or military families, although they thought that, you know, this therapy could be helpful. And so they had just hired Susanna Denny. I think you remember Susanna. Oh, absolutely. Uh, who, absolutely. Yeah, started started the program. And, uh, and my fellowship started like two months after she got there. And so we, you know, came together and, uh, and, you know, started building this, uh, this program from scratch. And, and, uh, um, which is, you know, still one of the coolest things, you know, I think that I've ever done professionally is, you know, is be a part of, of that. Um, but uh, it, while this was all happening, you know, what I, I didn't really understand was that, uh, you know, I was getting all this, uh, you know, this counseling by the transitive property, you know, was, uh, was you know, falling off over on me, and, you know, and, and making a huge difference. And, uh, uh, and also, you know, personally, uh, too, the Michigan Continues Fellowship was, uh, you know, it was a big life changer in a lot of ways. I mean, that's where I met Colleen. She was uh, in the um, uh, that orientation class, the Delta orientation class, doing her fellowship. And, uh, so a lot of a lot of things changed. It was a big pivot point. You know, so if, if I understood you correctly, your daughters, the, the counseling they went through, was it equine therapy? Yeah, it was. It, OK, it OK. Was, so uh, that, that was your I, I don't think I ever knew that. Yeah. That was your introduction yeah to it. And, and that's when, that's the change you were referencing that led you to EQuest because you yeah. saw how much it changed them. And, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I, I got to tell you, my, um, uh, you and, and Susanna, who one of my, you know, love, love, love her. Um, yeah. good uh, you guys opened up the doors one day to uh, uh, one of my daughters and her friend. Um, and it, it, I really do remember the connection that they, that they, both had it was really weird though my, my daughter was the one that was like I'm all in let's let's go do this and of course you know what turned her away was you know hey now you got to clean the horse you gotta you know you gotta <laughs> yeah, clean the stalls stall. <laughs> yeah, right. and she's like okay wait a minute this is you know I, I'm a girl I don't do this kind of thing but the other girl was really really shy and really uncertain about the horse it scared her mm-hmm. but then after a certain time you could see I mean, just all of a sudden she opened up and, and, and I, I just, I really saw, she took right to it. She didn't have any problem cleaning the horse. She didn't have any problem mucking the stall. She was all about, okay, I get it. I mean, it was, it was a really weird switch and I expected it to be opposite. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I got some insight in my own kid on that one, but uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> well, she no longer wants a horse though. <laughs> right. You know, it's one of those things. It's kind of uh, interesting that you, you know, you say that because that one of the big, biggest challenges that we always had from the very beginning was uh, uh, was actually getting people there. I mean, we knew that if we could you know, get them uh, connected with the horses that, you know, that you know, the the therapeutic benefits of that there's so many of them it's you know it's bound to happen but getting especially with veterans uh, i mean you know a lot of times we're our own worst enemy you know we we yes. don't want to admit that we got a problem at all and uh and if we do actually get to the point where we're willing to admit it, uh, that we've got a problem we don't want to admit that we need help to solve it you know this is something i can do you know yes you know, never you know i don't need to reach out well that's a gigantic barrier and uh, and it was carry the load was you know, probably as much as anything you know helped us to break down the barriers you know with with the potential clients you know the uh, the veterans who needed what we were offering out there at Equest and just because having having carry the load uh, acknowledge recognize us as one of the nonprofit partners and uh, and you know sort of give you know their stamp of approval uh, uh, you know. Uh, their endorsement uh, that we weren't just some you know, 
a bunch of crazy people out, you know, petting ponies and, uh, and stuff, that this was some real serious therapy that was going on there. That wound up, uh, uh, you know, making it easier for people to reach out and to uh, come to us. And, you know, after the, we were nonprofit partners with uh, Carry the Load, we went from uh, that very first full year, I think we had um, 60, uh, maybe maybe 60 and some change participants that whole year. That next year, we had over 200 in the year that we were a, a nonprofit partner. Year after that, we you know were up at between three and 400, which it stayed ever since. I mean, that's pretty much the maximum capacity. And, uh, and that was large, a large measure because you know, of carry the load and us being part of the continuum of care. You know. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And, and, and Jeff, I appreciate you being as raw as you are today. You have, uh, you've shared some, uh, I mean, really, you've shown some scars that, uh, you know, we always try to get people to understand. It's okay. Share your scars, show them, yeah. you know, because people need to see them, you know, don't, don't be, uh, don't be afraid of them. Don't be embarrassed by them. And, and you have lived that. And, you know, one, one of the things, you know, that I have always found to be, um, I, I just think fascinating about you is that, you know, here you go from being a fighter pilot you know, one of the, you know, the quote unquote sexier jobs in the, in the world to being a, a commercial pilot, which makes a really good living to getting your master's degree to saying, you know what, I don't need all of that. It's time for me to, to, to do some things that have nothing to do with anything like that. It's all about putting myself into other people. And when you did that and, and took that sabbatical and became a part of of eQuest, I, I just want to say how how humbled I am to be able to call you a friend because there there aren't that many people that can do what you did in that regard. I mean, there's always a reason why not to do it, and quite honestly, I may be one of those guys too. So, I, I mean, I respect you, man. I respect you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That was super kind words, Todd. Uh, it there um, there absolutely was a a personal benefit that. Uh, you know, that came with being connected to eQuest for so long. And, you know, I'm still on the board out there, although it's not a day to day thing, but it's, you know, it's paid back in spades and you know, uh, everything that I put in over there. Well, Jeff, uh, thank you very much for, for being with us today. And I, I want you to know, course, in yeah. honor of you, I wore a hat. I don't normally do it, but I think I've seen you one time, and that was at a black tie event uh, without a hat. It doesn't so, happen very often. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> That's true. But if I ever find myself on your flight, I'm sure you'll at least have it off while you're flying. So I, I love your hat, by the way. <laughs> I, hey, I do too. I've always yeah. liked this one. But yeah. hey, Jeff, again, one. thanks very much. All yeah. my best to Colleen and 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 all the uh, the mud hounds there. We uh, we really appreciate you being a great friend of Carry the Load for so long. Absolutely appreciate all your service to mankind in general, and so. Just want to say thanks, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Todd. And, uh, and thanks very much for having me uh, uh, be on. It, uh, it really was an honor to be part of this. Well, thank you very much. And to everybody else out there, thanks for watching. Please share this with folks because there, there are stories like this out there that people need to hear. And you've, you've some of you have heard me say it before, only 25% of Americans either serve actively in uniform or as a first responder or even volunteer to uh, in some form or fashion in their community. Just imagine if we could take that and go from one out of every four people to three out of every four people. And always, always, always remember, have a very good answer to this question. Who are you carrying?